Does it look good on my online? Okay. Set the microphone. Hey, hey Facebook world, how you doing? That was that was planned. That was actually that was planned, yeah. Yeah. So okay, welcome everybody to our weekly partners in Torah. Uh, changing it up here a little this week, uh, just with the calendar date being December twenty fifth, figured a lot of people were on vacation, a lot of people's partners were away, so we figured to toss it up a little bit. And as opposed to just offering our, regu our regular Chavrusa learning, we are offering Jesus the class. So uh, glad you all came for that. Thank you for coming. Quick public service announcement. We'll do it at the end as well, but this is also for Facebook world for not everyone who's watching. But we have our new program, get on the camera, right? We have our new program starting January 8th. And it'll officially be the first Tuesday of every month. It's going to be called the Pitch Morgue. Uh, besides our regular one-on-one -on -one learning, we're going to have an enhanced social and food program because, like I said, we're Jews. We like to eat. Uh, the program will be 7 to 8.30, and uh, we'll offer a number of classes for each one. And this is for the first one you can take on your way out. I'm going to be giving a class 6,000 years in 60 minutes. It's all of Jewish history from the beginning of time until present times. You might think that, uh, that it's pretty impressive that I can cover 6,000 years in 60 60 minutes, but for those of you who don't know me, you don't know how fast I talk, so it works out just fine. Uh, what takes most of like a whole semester to do, I can do in 60 minutes from my length of, uh, from my speed of talk. Rabbi Friedman will be giving lessons from a diehard sports fan, and Mrs. Alex Fletcher will be giving my father converted, now what? And we're going to have sushi provided by Bar Sushi, that'll start at 7 p.m. at Federation, January 8th. Be sure to take a card on your way out and share it with all your friends. It's going to be a great program, free to everybody who comes, but we ask to please RSVP so that we know how much sushi to get. Okay, now that uh, that's done, let's get started and talking about Jesus. Uh, by the way, this is not Rabbi Landis trying to convert you to Christianity. For anyone who thought that's what they were getting, this is not what they're getting. Someone actually responded to the email that I sent out, who's on my, someone who's on my email list, saying, you know, you should really change that title because I thought this was an email from a missionary. And no, it's just Landis talking about the concept of Jesus. And I figure it's apropos because all of us had a day off of work today. Unless you're a rabbi, you have to work every day. But for those who have a non-rabbinical job, you had off of work today because according to the Christian calendar, according to... To the according to the uh, the Christian holidays, this was Jesus's birthday. So I figured, as Jews who typically don't believe in Jesus, we should address the question as to who Jesus was, why we don't believe in him, and we're also going to touch on the question if he even existed. So those are the questions we're going to hope to tackle in the next forty minutes or so. And uh, hey, hopefully, it'll be fun and interesting. So let's start with the question that I think often gets missed. For those of us in the workplace, uh, we interact with our non-Jewish co-workers. Uh, many of us have a lot of non-Jewish friends. Many of us have non-Jewish family. And the question often comes up as to why do the Jews not believe in Jesus? And many of us, uh, even rabbis included, don't really know how to answer that. We might say, what do you mean? I was raised Jewish. Why would I believe in Jesus? They say, yeah, but Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is all these wonderful things. Why don't you believe in him? And many of us stop and say, I don't know, why don't I believe in him? I don't believe in him because that's what my mother told me, and that's what her mother told her, and that's what her mother told her. Tradition! But really, what is the reason why we don't believe in Jesus? So in truth, we can answer the question just with starting with simple definitions. What is the claim of what Jesus is, and does he fit the qualification of that claim? So if we had any uh, Christian defendants of Jesus here today, they would tell us Jesus is the Messiah. So what is the Messiah? It's a word that's thrown around a lot, and I think that many people actually have no clue what it means. So Messiah is quite simply the English word for the Hebrew word Mashiach. Right? You ever heard the term Mashiach? Messiah, Messiah is just English for Mashiach. What does Mashiach mean? It means the anointed one. It means something quite practical. It is a verb. It means the person who had oil spilt on their head. If you are a cook and you're in a kitchen, there's a mishap, and you bump into a shelf that has oil on it, the oil falls on your head, you are now the Mashiach. And maybe that's what happened to Jesus. I don't know. But, uh, but that is, at its definition, Mashiach, Messiah, means the anointed one. So what does it mean to be anointed? So Judaism, we have this really cool thing that when we want to... Uh, uplift someone or exalt someone to a high position, we do it by dumping sacred oil on their head. 
Okay, whole, uh, there's, there's many spiritual ideas behind it, quite simply. Oil is a representation of, of something natural, but something that needs the effort of man. It's both natural, it, means the, it needs the effort of man to bring it out. So it, it represents uplifting something natural. You take the, the olive, you squeeze it, you get wonderful olive oil, which in many senses is considered even more significant than the oil. So that is why when we take the average person, we uplift them to something on, more spiritually uplifted. We do it by putting olive oil on their head. Now, there are two different groups of people, or two different positions, if you will, that are anointed in Jewish history and Jewish ideals. One is, anyone here a Kohen? Anyone here a priest? Got a few here? Okay, so if you uh, had lived in the times of the temple, you could have quite possibly been the high priest, right? Now, you can only become the high priest if you start off as a priest. If you weren't born a priest, not, nothing we can do to help you here. Except for that guy who went to his rabbi and said, Rabbi, you know, it's really really important for me to be a Kohen. I, I, can you just make me a Kohen? The rabbi says, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do to make you a Kohen. He says, Rabbi, I'll give you $1,000 if you can just make me a Kohen. He says, look, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do to make you a Kohen. He says, Rabbi, $5,000 to the synagogue, check today if you can make me a Kohen. He said, look, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. Rabbi, $100,000 on this check to the shul today if you can just make me a Kohen. Rabbi Sobstrom and says, $100,000? You know, let me, let me see what I can do. Let me go get some oil. Let's see if we can make it happen. And he says, but you know, I, I, have to, I have to ask you, why is it so important for you to be a Kohen? He says, oh, well, my father was a Kohen. My grandfather was a Kohen. My great-grandfather was a Kohen. <laughs> so that's really how you become a Kohen. But if you start off as a Kohen, you have the ability to become the head Kohen, the Kohen Gadol, and the ceremony in which that would happen is they would take olive oil and dump it on your head. Again, showing that idea of taking something that's naturally great, but uplifting it. And that's how you became the Kohen Gadol. So technically, if we use the term Messiah, Mashiach, it could be any of the people who raised their hand that they're a Kohen, if they were the high priest, because the high priest was a Mashiach also. Now, there is another group of, another position that to be, uh, to take that position, you had to be anointed, and that was the position of? King. King of Israel. King of both, by the way, when the kingdom split into two, both the kings of Judah and Israel got anointed with oil. And, uh, but that is how you became king. First of all, if you were, if you were in the, the kingdom of Judah, which typically followed the Davidic line, uh, you were partially born into it, but you still had to be anointed. You had to be called out by the prophet, and the prophet had to dump oil on your head to anoint you. And that is how you became the Mashiach. So those are the only two definitions we have of people in the whole spectrum of Torah that are called Mashiach, that are called Messiah. So when there's a claim that Jesus was the Messiah, are they claiming that he was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, or are they claiming that he is the king of Israel? So good question. So what does it mean to be the high priest? Well, high priest means that you have to have a temple, uh, do, not, not a temple like Tiferet Israel, but actually like the temple, the big temple in, the, in Israel. You have to have a temple, you have to have the temple service, and you have the high priest who leads the family of the, the, the leads the group of Kohanim who work in that temple. So do we have a temple today? Unfortunately not. For the past 2,000 years, we've not had a temple. And, uh, and therefore, if we don't have a temple, we don't have a high priest. You can have a Kohen, but you can't have a Kohen Gadol. So the claim that Jesus is the Messiah can't they can't be there claiming he's the high priest because there is no high priest. There is no temple to be a high priest in. So no high priest. So therefore, by process of elimination, it must be that the claim is that Jesus is the king of Israel. Do we have kings nowadays? Okay, I know in Israel, if you follow the press, they refer to Netanyahu as King Bibi because he's been in power for so long. But last time I checked, to become the prime minister of Israel, they did not anoint you, they did not make you king. Yeah, okay, got it. Sorry about Facebook, my phone was going off. I forgot to put it on uh, airplane mode. Um, let me put it on airplane mode so we have that fixed on. We'll show the crowd for a minute. Okay, sorry. Okay, Sherry, we're, we're good? We're still recording? Okay. So when was the last time we had a king of Israel? Throw another, a little bit of a trick question. So you, you might want to say the time of the, of the Hanukkah story, the time of the Maccabees, and you would be partially true because the Maccabees did usurp the kingship, but they weren't really kings. They called themselves kings, but they weren't really kings. In other words, they were not anointed. They did not fulfill the qualification of being kings. 
really the last true king we had of Israel was at King Tzidkiyahu, who was a descendant of King David, who was there at the time that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple in the year 420 before, or 422 before the Common Era. So basically for the past 2400 years, we have not had a king. And by the way, we can't have a king. It's impossible for us to have a king because in order to have a king, we have to have the full spectrum of Judaism. What do I mean by the full spectrum? Well, we already mentioned before the temple. We gotta have a temple, do we have a temple? No. Not only do we have to have a, a temple, we have to have something called the Sanhedrin, the high court. Do we have a Sanhedrin? No. By the way, there have been several attempts in the past 500 years to restart the Sanhedrin, but bottom line is there's no Sanhedrin. So you, we don't even have the, the functionaries of, uh, of having a king. Now, here's the last piece, and here's where we get into the more, the more sort of esoteric or, the, uh, or the, the lofty idea of Mashiach or Messiah. Once the kingship ceased to exist in the year 422 before the Common Era, there was this concept that was passed down from our rabbis, mentioned already in Tanakh, mentioned in the, in the prophets, passed down from the rabbis, that how will it be that the kingship will be restarted? The ideal way for the kingship is it has to go in the line of David. That means that you, and specifically through the same family, it has to be Ben Acher Ben, as we call it in Hebrew, son after son. It's got to go down. How can we even identify that nowadays? And the further we got from Tzidkiyahu, the harder it got to identify. By the way, throughout the second temple, they were still able to identify it. Even until a little bit into the, the, uh, the common era, if you will, the, the first few centuries, it could still be identified. But for sure at this point, it can't be identified. So the question came up, how are we going to know? How are we going to know who the proper king of Israel is? And the prophets talk about this in a number of places, Yechezkel, uh, Yeshaya, many of them talk about it, is that there's the concept of Eliyahu Hanavi, that Elijah the prophet has the job of anointing the next king, right? Because it has to be anointed by prophet. Do we have prophecy nowadays? No, ever since the destruction of the first temple, or really the beginning of the second temple, we haven't had prophets anymore. Judaism has been a non-profit organization. And, and you need a prophet. Do we have prophets? No. Now there's one prophet that our sages tell us never died, and that's Elijah. Now there's a whole discussion in and of itself. Maybe one day we'll give a class on Elijah. Whole discussion why he didn't die. But part of why he didn't die is because he gave up on the Jewish people. So because he gave up on the Jewish people, he will never die? Yes, because his punishment, if you will, was God said, you can't give up on the Jewish people, and I'm going to prove it to you. You have three jobs from now on throughout time. Job number one is every time a baby boy is born and we give him a bris milo, we bring him into the covenant, you're going to be there to witness it, to see that throughout the generations, the Jews never forsake God. Number two, Pesach Seder, when the Jews celebrate the beginning of, our, of us becoming a religion, you're going to be there to witness it. That's time number two. And what's job number three that Elio has? You're going to be the prophet that I'm going to hang around, I'm going to keep around to anoint that king when it's time to anoint the next king. So we have this, you know, lucky for us, we have one prophet who never died, one prophet is able to... You know, we get into Kabbalistic ideas. He sort of floats between being an angel and being a human. But he has the job of anointing the next king and has to be done by Elijah. So in truth, I really answered the question for you already. Because someone would ask you, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? And based on what I threw out to you as the definition of the Messiah, and based on what you may or may not know about Jesus and Christianity, does he fulfill, the, does he fulfill the, the checklist? Not at all. Not even one step of the checklist. All the way down to, as I mentioned, the Messiah has to be a descendant of David. And it has to be how? Ben Acher Ben, son from son. That's how the lineage passed down. Right? Our, our status as a Jew goes through our mother. Our tribal status goes through our father. So therefore, he has to be a descendant of David through his father. What does Christianity say, or who does Christianity say Jesus' father was? God. God is not a descendant of David. I'm sorry, it's just, it, it, he was not. So you can't have this idea of immaculate conception of the virgin birth and say that he's a descendant of David. It just doesn't work. Okay, they fetch that a little bit, but that's, that's already a problem. But even, even beyond that, let, let, let's, let's take it to the next level. So I think we have it clear here. Was Jesus the king of Israel? No. 
At, at no point in time, he lived for, I don't know, 30-something years. Was he ever the king of Israel? No, not at all. There was no king during the second temple. At no point in the second temple, when they say Jesus existed, was there ever a king? Not at all. So he was never the king. So he wasn't a king. He's not from David. And we're going to see there's some other problems, too, uh, that, that make, it, make it pretty clear. So I'd like to jump to a famous Rambam here. We say it's a famous Rambam because I actually know it. If I didn't know it, it wouldn't be famous. Uh, but Rambam, or Maimonides, is one of the great Jewish philosophers from, uh, from roughly 900 years ago. And he did a fascinating thing for the Jewish people. By the way, any Sephardim in the room? I see we have Dr. Israeli back here. Uh, Sephardic Jews, Rambam is your rabbi. They call him, uh, they call him Harav or, or Rabban. What do you call him, Rabban? What's the name you have for him? You have a fancy name for him. Moran, don't you call Moran? Or is that Ravadi Yosef? Bit Yosef. Anyways, so so Rambam was a Sephardic rabbi and, and he did and he wrote he wrote three monumental works. Now any one of these monumental works would have saved him for posterity. He would have been he would have been known as a great scholar in the Jewish people. He wrote three. One is called the Pirusha Mishnayas, the commentary on the Mishnah, which by the way, he wrote in Arabic. So it was like the first art scroll of its time because art scroll is the vernacular. I'm sorry, art scroll. Arabic was a vernacular of the, of, uh, in where he lived in Egypt. So he wrote the commentary on the Mishnah in Arabic. Another one was called the Mar Nevuchim, the Guide to the Perplex, which was sort of taken an Aristotelian approach to Jewish philosophy. And the third and probably his, uh, his uh, magnum opus was something called the Mishnah Torah. Mishnah Torah means repetition of the Torah because his goal was to be able to make one book that had within it everything. In fact, he writes his introduction that all you need, now that I've completed this, this series, it's 14 books in total, now that I've completed it, all you need to understand what, it, what you need to do to be a Jew is you need a Chumash and you need the Yad Chazaka, you need the, the Mishnah Torah. Everything else is superfluous now, you don't need it. Now the Almighty with his divine sense of, with his divine sense of humor made it that there's never been another book that spawned off more commentaries than the Mishnah Torah. But anyways, be it as it may, it's a wonderful place for us to look for the great summary of everything that's in the Talmud, of everything that's in Jewish philosophy, of everything that's in the Midrashim. And right in this discussion, he gives us the exact definition of the Messianic era. He tells us what the Messiah will be, what the Messiah had to do. He gives us the checklist. So I'm just, I'm going to take here from, this is, uh, this is the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges, of the 14 books, and the chapters on, uh, on kings, on kings and kingship. So he says, So the king, as we said, the king Mashiach, the Messiah will come and he will reinstitute the kingship of David. And he will do it just like it was originally. He's going to build the temple, and he's going to bring back all the Jews. Again, did Jesus build the temple? No. In fact, according to them, he was around when the temple still stood. And the temple was destroyed shortly after he lived. So not only did he not build it, he was quite possibly, you know, had something to do with destroying it. And he'll also bring back the Nidcha Yisrael, bring back the exiles of Israel. Second temple, did all the Jews live in Israel? No. The majority of the Jews were in Babylon. Did any of those Jews come back with Jesus? No, none at all. The Chayzerin call Hamidishpatim b'yamav kishuk mekodem, and he'll bring back all the laws as they originally were, and he'll bring people closer to the Torah, and he'll make it that they want to follow the commandments, and they'll have faith in the Almighty, and it'll be a wonderful, as we call, tshuva revolution. It'll be all the Jews coming back to connect to Judaism again. Did Jesus do any of that? No. He told he told everyone not to follow Judaism. He said you know he said you don't have to keep Shabbos anymore, which he says he said straight out in the New Testament. He said you don't have to follow the law anymore. The whole concept of Jesus dying for your sins comes straight out of the New Testament. Because Jesus died, there's no need to follow the laws anymore. We have Rambam telling us straight here that it has to be that the Messiah will get the Jews and encourage them to follow the commandments. So, you know, he's like 0 for 20 at this point for possibly being the Jewish Messiah. And, and then in the end of the chapter, Maimonides really sums it, sums it up. And he says, let's say just hypothetically, let's say you have a candidate to be Mashiach. Okay, I think we're clear at this point, Jesus is not even a candidate. But let's say hypothetically you have a candidate. Throughout Jewish history, there have been candidates. We have had false messiahs, and we have had people that, uh, that there are groups that will attribute to them and call them the messiah. So Maimonides tells us straight out, he gives us a checklist. 
He says, let's say you have a king who's a descendant from the house of David, and he's, and he's strong in his observance of the Torah, and he, uh, and he follows the commandments, just like David, his, his father, and uh, he follows the oral Torah, he follows the written Torah, and he fights the wars of Hashem, the wars of God, just like David did. And, uh, you know, once he's at that point, Becheska's Hushu Mashiach. It's possible that he could be the Messiah. So, again, has to be strong in the Torah, both the written Torah, the oral Torah, has to fight the wars of God, and at that point, he's in the running. Again, Jesus, I think not. But, okay, that's at least someone who's in the running. Uh, and, and then he goes on, he says, and, and if he's successful and he's able to conquer all the nations that are, that are challenging the Jewish people, in other words, fight off all the, all the uh, enemies of the Jewish people, and he brings all the Jewish people back to the land of Israel, do we all live in Israel? No, half the Jews in the world right now live in Israel, which in itself is miraculous, but, but not all the Jews, but Rambam says right here, got to bring all the Jews back to Israel. At that point, at that point, at that point, he's for sure Mashiach. So if he fights off all the enemies, right, he fights off Al-Qaeda, he fights off Hamas, he fights off, uh, he fights off, uh, he fights off uh, all, all the different, uh, you know, Iran and all the different enemies of the Jewish people, and then he brings all the Jews back to Israel, then, then he's Bavada, he's for sure Mashiach. <coughs> Here's the zinger. The Mohit Sliach Akon, if he doesn't achieve all of this, oh, Nahar, or he's killed, or if in those battles that he's fighting, he ends up being killed, or if he dies off, then at that point, we know for sure he is not the Messiah. So here's the big thing Maimonides is saying here. Once the guy dies, he's out of the running. Right? You can't die and be the Messiah. No second coming. It makes it very clear here. If you die, you are out of the running. So I think Maimonides, if we weren't clear before we opened Maimonides, I think Maimonides makes it very clear that it is basically impossible for Jesus to have been the Jewish Messiah. The way the church answers a lot of this is with the doctrine of the second coming. But, uh, you know, Maimonides says it straight up, no second coming. If he doesn't do it all when he's alive, if the temple's not built, if he doesn't bring back all the Jews, if he doesn't strengthen Torah and Mitzvahs and do all these wonderful things, no, you're not, you're not even the, you're not, you're not in the running, or even if you are in the running, you are not it. So I think it's pretty clear. Parenthetically, my, my mind is answered the fascinating piece. We're going to talk in a few minutes about the idea of the Christian censors. That, uh, that in the beginning of the time of the printing press, and even really before that, Jewish books had to go through Christian censors before they could be published. And there's a lot of different mentionings of Christianity and, and, and Jesus and different things that were taken out of our books. And this is a prime example of that. Luckily, we've been able to piece it back together. In a, in, a, in a strange twist of fate, one of the ways that we've been able to piece it back together is the greatest repository in the world of Jewish books is where? In the Vatican. And until about uh, 40 years ago, Jews were not allowed in there to see them. Uh, around 40 years ago, they started letting Jews go in to see what was there, to see the books. Uh, initially, they could not copy anything. They could just go in and look at the books. And around the 80s, they could take it out on microfiche. I think now they're, they're, they're allowed to see a good amount of what's there. It, it's all recorded. So, so that was a big source of what gave us the Jesus text that had been edited out of a lot of our, uh, our, our intellectual spectrum, uh, our, our intellectual works. So this is a perfect example of this. Um, this little next piece in Maimonides was taken out, and, uh, and just in this edition, it was called the Frankel edition, was the first one to put this piece back in. So he says, he says over here... <coughs> I took it out again. Right, I took it out again, right. Uh, okay. And all these things, all these things we've talked about. Shall uh, Yeshu Hanatsri. Does anyone know who Yeshu Hanatsri is? What does that sound like? Jesus of Nazareth, right? So all these things we talked about when it comes to Jesus, good old Jesus. Vishal Zeh Hayishma'eli. And that... Ishmaelite. Who's that Ishmaelite? Muhammad, right? So, right? So we had Jesus, and then after Jesus came Muhammad. 
Uh, the whole reason for them, the whole reason why Jesus was so successful, and the whole reason, or not really Jesus, as we'll see in a moment, but his descendants were so successful, and the whole reason Muhammad and Islam was so successful, is quite simple. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little bit of a poetic spin on the, on the piece of Maimonides here. The reason is, because we as Jews, were not doing a good enough job of taking the idea of monotheism to the world, so we needed this cousin to go off that way and take the Westerners to monotheism, and we need this cousin to go up this way and take the Easterners to, to monotheism. And that's the whole reason why they were so successful, is because not enough people were becoming monotheists. There were too many pagans in the world. Too many people were too far away from the ideas of Judaism. So you have these offshoots that went out. The Christians were able to get a, uh, are able to get a billion followers. The, the Muslims were able to get another billion followers. And like that, we have a good amount of people in the world who are following the ideas of monotheism, at least you know, roughly believe in some of the same ideas we are, at least brought, says Maimonides, are brought closer to the ideas of Judaism, so that when Mashiach comes, it'll be easier for them. It'll be a smoother transition that they're already sort of in the loop, in the intellectual family. Okay, it's not somewhat related to what we're talking about, but just a fascinating piece nonetheless. So basically, I think it's pretty clear at this point, uh, before I get into the second part, that, um, you know, the, Jesus was, was not the Messiah. He was not in the running for the Messiah. He basically didn't do anything that could have could, that could have made him the Messiah, other than you know Christianity had to rewrite things, uh, had to rewrite their doctrine, had to play with it to make it that he was their Messiah. But if you look at our classical sources, uh, again summarized beautifully in Maimonides, they are uh, they just uh, fell very very short. So I just want to touch on, on some other inter interesting things, and then we're going to conclude with the idea of um, historically, did he even exist? Now that we talk so much about him, we're going to ask the question if historically he even existed. So there's an interesting, uh, we, we mentioned before the idea of the virgin birth. Right, Christianity says that Mary was a virgin, that, uh, that she and her husband Joseph were never together, and miraculously she gave birth to Jesus. By the way, in Jewish law, if she was married and she had a baby not from her husband, from another man, that's not called the Messiah, that's called a mamzer. They got the wrong word, right? The mamzer is the term we give for that. That's a person who's born uh, from, an, uh, from an ancestral, from an uh, adulterous relationship. So, but, uh, but there's a concept of the virgin birth. So where does it come from? So in the book of Isaiah, there's, uh, there's a word used in the, in the Hebrew, Alma, to describe seemingly the mother of the king, the mother of Mashiach. It, it seems that that's what Isaiah is talking about, and talks about this Alma will give birth to the Messiah, or give birth to Mashiach. Now, Alma in Hebrew is a young lady. It's just a term for young woman. It does not mean a virgin. It does not mean anything other than a young woman. But... About a week ago, we had a fast day called the 10th of Teves. One of the things that we mourn on the 10th of Teves is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Torah. The, right, the Torah being translated into Greek by 70 rabbis. There were several, several mistranslations, and some intentional, some just that what the Greek demanded, and one of them was this. The word Alma, when you translate it into Greek, the same word in Greek for young lady and virgin, is, it's the same word. The word for young lady and virgin in Greek is the same exact word. So when the Torah gets translated, the Tanakh is translated into Greek, it becomes that word. My Greek's not very good, so I forget it this time. Anyone here fluent in Greek? Anyone? So the word was already a, dual, a, a, a dualistic meaning. The next translation was the Latin translation. The Latins did not, the Latins, the Romans did not go back to the Hebrew Bible to translate. They translated from the Greek. So when they saw that word, the Greek translation of Alma, which could mean either virgin or young lady, they took it simply as virgin, which in Latin was just one word. And that was the beginning of the doctrine of the virgin birth. It all comes from a mistranslation. And, uh, and you know, then you go on to the next translation, which was the German translation, which was just a translation of the Latin. And then you have the King James Bible, which was a translation of the German. So basically, up until modern times, the, the, the Christian Bible was the King James Bible in English, which was an English translation of a German translation of a Latin translation of a Greek translation that had mistranslations in it. And they have a whole doctrine based on that. So that's, uh, that's one uh, very, very interesting problem with Christianity, that one of their... Solid doctrines come straight from mistranslation. 
one chapter that will be thrown at you quite often if you talk to a missionary is Isaiah chapter 53, the quote-unquote suffering servant chapter. And the, the chapter describes this whole concept of the suffering servant who takes the burden of the world on his back and who is, who is beat up throughout all the generations. And that's where the, whole, the Christians say that was talking about Jesus, clearly talking about Jesus, and that that is the whole idea of Jesus dying for your sins. That's where it comes from, chapter 53. Chapter 53 is a long chapter. I encourage you to go home. Don't read in the King James Version. Read in an art scroll or Sincino or a Jewish, you know, or, or uh, not, not Sincino, in Koran or a Jewish translation. But if you read the chapter in and of itself, you would say, okay, quite possibly this is talking about one individual. Quite possibly this is talking about who they say Jesus is. I could see how they fit it in. There's one thing the missionaries do is that they have this trick. And you can use this if they ever come knocking on your door. They'll start quoting you chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, the suffering servant. You stop and say, whoa, 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 whoa. You seem so well versed in the book of Isaiah. Tell me, what's it say in chapter 52 of Isaiah? Um, there's a 52nd chapter? I didn't know that. Um, right? They, they have no clue because they're given sound bites. Any verse they're quoting, it's a sound bite. They don't know what came before and what came after. And for those of us who've ever studied anything in Tanakh, we know that we always have to look at the context. Yeah, and really, and, and forget about Torah study, in any, in any pursuit, any, if you're trying to understand any document, you don't take things out of context. You've got to look what became what came before and what came after. And a perfect example of that is chapter 53 of Isaiah. Now, interestingly enough, the chapters that we have, the chapters that we use are, are from the Christians. The, up until the Christians came along, there were no such thing as chapters in Tanakh. It was a lot more complicated in synagogue when they had to call out the page number, right? You couldn't call it chapter and verse. They had to call it like Parsha and verse. That was, that was the only way to do it. The Christians came in and put the chapters in place, and it was very convenient, so we kept them. But many of them, it, it's, not broken up, it's not broken up quite right. Have you ever noticed why, if you get to the end of the weekly Torah reading, and there's like the end of a chapter and then like one verse of the next chapter, that's because they didn't care about the weekly Torah reading, right? They cared about whatever thematically, whatever thematic way they wanted to break it up. And Isaiah chapter 53 is a perfect example of it. They cut it in a nice clean way that it looks like it might be talking about one guy named Jesus. Well, if you read chapter 52... And if you read chapter 54, and again, there's no chapter breaks. In reality, the way that this was written down by Isaiah, there were no chapter breaks. It's clearly not talking about Jesus. It's clearly talking about who? The Jewish people. He is clearly talking about the Jewish people throughout history. He's clearly talking about what the Jewish people are going to go through uh, as their history progresses. And that they're going to be, they're going to be a, 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 uh, an oppressed nation. They're going to live forever. They're going, to, they're going to be oppressed by everyone in the world. And that's what's played out. Again, one of the, uh, the, interest, the interesting paradoxes, one of the, uh, you know, when we talk about the different tormentors of the Jewish people throughout history, one of, one of you know, around the time of Maimonides, just after Maimonides, around the same time as Maimonides, after Maimonides, the Crusaders, right? A lot of the bloodshed that the Jews have gone through throughout time, which is clearly referred to in Isaiah chapter 53, happened at the hand of the Christians. So just a strange irony of life. So just so you know, if anyone ever brings up to you chapter 53, say, well, let's, let's look at chapter 52 and read it together and see how this fits in context. And you'll see clearly at that point as a metaphor referring to the Jewish people and nothing more than that. Um, one last thing before we get into the history of it a little bit is, is th there's many other the uh, theolo theological pieces in Christianity that take it so far from Judaism. At no point, and I think this goes without saying at this point in the lecture, at no point do we say the Messiah is God. At no point do we say he's the Son of God. At no point do we say he's the Father. At no point do we say he's the Holy Ghost. No trinities in Judaism. We, Maimonides says it clearly. It's a human, descendant of David, human being, nothing spiritual, no virgin birth, no Son of God, no God, no trinity. That is not Jewish. And therefore, Christianity, in, in specific Catholicism, very much refers to Jesus as our Lord, our Savior. No, <laughs> the king is an emissary of God on earth. It is not God himself, right? God's the only God. God does not come down and be a human. That's not what we do as Jews, right? But that's, that's another, another thing that they throw out there that is a, a, little, uh, a little problematic. Okay, we got about 15 minutes left to wrap it up. By the way, uh, the, uh, the Jim and everyone is, Jim and Linda and Brian are still here. If anyone is getting hungry, please grab something else. As my father always says, seconds are encouraged, thirds are admired. So please feel free to get something else uh, while, we're, while we're going to the last section here. Let's get to the history of it a little bit. 
Did Jesus ever exist? I want to throw out one more, one more point as I have on my, my notes here, but it really belongs earlier. If Jesus was truly the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, his name would not have been Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is Latin, right? What does Christ mean in Latin? What? No, Mashiach. It means Mashiach, anointed one, right? It means the anointed one. So if he was really the Jewish Messiah, wouldn't it have made much more sense to call him Jesus Mashiach? By the way, he had a Jewish name too, according to at least the Jews of Jesus, there was Yeshua, right? Shouldn't he have been Yeshua Mashiach? Right? He's a Jewish king. Give him a Jewish name. Why are you giving him a Roman name? Because it was the Romans really created him, as we'll see. And uh, just an interesting point there. Okay, let's get into the historical dating of Jesus. So a lot of what I've told you is the snapshot of who he was comes from the New Testament. You can check it all out over there. Let's look at some Jewish sources. So let me ask you a question. If you had this guy walking around on the planet... And there was a, uh, you know, the feeling that he was the Mashiach, that he was going to bring, again, the complicated temple is still standing, but again, he was going to restart the divinity monarchy. He was going to bring at least the second temple into being the eternal temple. Um, what do you think the Jewish response would have been to that? Yippee. Yippee, right? Yippee. So it would have gone either pro or con. Let's, let's say either if it was a big movement that was making waves in the world, it would have, you would have been pro or con. For sure, Jews have opinions. We all know, right? Two Jews, three opinions. And we make our opinions known. Uh, you know, anyone who goes on the Cleveland Jewish Facebook group knows that better than anybody. Every Jew has got to always make their opinion known. So if there's this guy walking around saying he was Mashiach, or his, or his 12 disciples were saying he was, the 12 apostles were saying he was the Mashiach, that would have probably made a little bit of a stink, right? I mean, in Israel, you have two political parties, the two us Americans look exactly the same, and they're fighting constantly, and they're fighting in the streets, and they're, they're having hafganaz, they're having, they're having boycotts and all kinds of stuff, and they're arguing over razor-thin issues. So there's a guy walking around saying he's Mashiach, you're going to be pro or you're going to be con, but it's probably going to make, as we would say, a rash gadol, probably make some, uh, make some noise. So we have two historical records from the time of Jesus. One is known as our Talmud. Our Talmud, as we know it, the process of writing it down started in roughly the year 200, but it records everything from the end of Tanakh, which is at the beginning of the Second Temple, 350 before the Common Era, up until 500 of the Common Era. So it's 850 years of Jewish history encapsulated in our Talmud. Okay? How many times has the Talmud mentioned Jesus? So, possibly twice. Now, we'll get to why possibly in a moment. If there was really this mass movement going around, Mashiach, yay, no, we're fighting, we're fighting, we're going to crucify him, we're going to not crucify him, we're against, we're pro, we're whatever it is that you see in the New Testament, don't you think the Talmud should talk about it a little bit? There's this big fight going on, there's this guy named Jesus, people thought he was Mashiach, and, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he walked on water, and he was a fisherman, and all these great things, and in the end he was crucified. Um, don't you think like it should be talked about a little bit? By the way, there was another false messiah that did make a rash gadol, a big, a big stink, if you will, about a hundred years after the Christians say Jesus existed by the name of Shimon Bar Kokhba. Anyone ever been to those caves near Beit Shemesh in Israel where you like, crawl through on your belly? And, uh, or anyone ever been to the city of Betar in Israel, uh, the modern-day city of Betar? That was where his headquarters were. They said these underground, these underground fortresses, and he was a force to reckon with. He had a war with the Romans. It was a massive war. It was a massive war. Talmud talks about it at length. He was a false messiah. He died. Again, Rambam says, you die, you're out. But it talks about him. It talks about the pros and the cons. Some were for him, some were against him. Rabbi Kiva was for him, many other rabbis were against him. It talks about him. The Talmud makes maybe two mentioning in the, in the roughly 2,000 folio pages of the Talmud, folio meaning front and back, so 4,000 pages, there are two maybe mentionings of Jesus. Why do I say maybe? Because the person who we say might be Jesus in the Talmud, the name is the same one Maimonides uses, Yeshu. Yeshu. Now, the ones who want to say it's Jesus say that's Yehoshua, his Hebrew name, but we don't want to, you know, as Steve was kind of criticizing, now, making fun of me a little bit without saying his name, right? They don't want to say his name straight out, so they say Yeshu. By the way, Yeshu can also be an anachronym for Yamach Shemo Vezichron, which means his name should be erased from history. But that's it. This Yeshu is referred to a handful of times in the Talmud. One time is he has a showdown with his rabbi. He's misbehaving. He's looking at, you know, looking, commenting on the way women looked. His rabbi gets mad at him and he sends him away. He tries to come back and repent. The rabbi sends him away again. He tries a third time. Rabbi is in the middle of praying, so he doesn't answer. And the, this Yeshua says, you know what? I'm done. Obviously, I can't come back. 
the Talmud actually gives us a great life lesson there, which is my, a great lesson for parents, grandparents, anyone. That when you have to give someone rebuke, when you have to push someone away, you're, you're, you push them away with your right hand, but you've got to pull them close with your left hand. got to make sure it's not too intense. got to make sure to keep them in the loop. And this rabbi of Yeshu is criticizing the Talmud for being a little too intense and leading Yeshu away from Judaism to become some kind of sorcerer, some kind of idol worshiper. That's what the Talmud tells us about him. Okay, could that be Jesus? Possibly. You know, Yeshu, the name fits. He left Judaism, started a new religion. That's what the Talmud says. One big problem here. Who was that rabbi of Yeshu? His name was Yehoshua ben Prachia. Okay? We know who Yeshua ben Prachia is. We know exactly when he lived. He was the head of the Sanhedrin when? At the time of the Maccabees. At the time of the Hanukkah story. When did the Hanukkah miracle happen? Roughly the year 150 before the Common Era. When do Christians say Jesus existed? Zero, right? He was born in zero, died at 32, whatever it was. Yeah, so, so let's say the one out of two mentions of, Jesus, of Yeshu in the Talmud, your dating's way off if that's Jesus, right? You got big dating problems here. And the other mentioning is, is seemingly referring to the same person, talks about his eternal punishment in Gehenna. Okay, but there's no date attributed to that one, so we'll leave that one on the side for now. Okay, that's it. That's what the Talmud says about him. So, again, I'll leave that for you just to think about, that if this was all really going on, everything it says in the New Testament was going on, it should probably be addressed a little bit. No, Bar Kokhba's addressed. Number two, the original history book of the Jews is a book called, a book called Antiquity, uh, Antiquities of the Jews, written by someone named Flavius Josephus. Right, Flavius Josephus was a observant Jew, was part of the, uh, the, the Perushim, the Pharisees, uh, at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. And uh, he ended up becoming the, the ultimate Benedict Arnold. And when push came to shove, he defected to the Romans. He ended up becoming a historian for the Romans. And he wrote down the history of the Jews. He wrote one book called The Antiquities of the Jews, which talked about everything from creation up until his time. And then another book called The War of the Jews, which talked about all the wars that the Jews fought against the Romans. Now, he's a, he's a historian. He's, he's working for the Romans. He's writing for the Romans. Anyone ever seen the book, Antiquities of the Jews, translated into, or, or actually the complete works of Jos Josephus, translated into English? It's about this thick, size 0.5 font. You literally need three magnifying glasses to be able to read it, okay? How many times does Josephus mention Jesus? Three times. One, uh, scholars agree is a forgery. It was put in by the Christians to try and... Uh, you know, to try and make a case for Jesus. One is probably referring to Yeshu, this guy who lived a lot earlier. And the other one refers to that we have this guy, James, who was the brother of Jesus who claimed he was the Messiah. That's it. And the thousands of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pages of Josephus, that's all he mentions the guy. So we got the Talmud, almost nothing there. We got Josephus, almost nothing there. So when we talk about the historical dating of Jesus, it's questionable. Questionable if he ever existed or if he existed in the time period that he said he did. There's an interesting exchange from a rabbi named Rav Kellerman. Rav Kellerman had a correspondence with the Vatican, uh, raising a number of these questions. Uh, one, he asked him about the virgin birth. He asked him about uh, the New Testament gives conflicting Davidic lines, and he asked about uh, and he asked about if Jesus lived in Jerusalem or Galilee, which is which again is a as we would say a stira, it's a contradiction in the New Testament. And through the he decided that these were pointed questions because for whatever reason. And in his correspondence with the Vatican, the Vatican basically said, "Yeah, we know Christianity was heavily influenced by the pagans. It was kind of you know bringing together a lot of different ideas, and we're not so caught up on the history." So the Catholic Church and of themselves even says, okay, Jesus, nice idea, but if he existed, we don't really know. That's what they come out saying. So when it comes to historically dating Jesus, it's quite complicated. By the way, Jesus had how many students? Twelve. Twelve apostles, right? How many are mentioned Josephus? One. Is it a forgery? Most scholars say yes. Uh, how many are mentioned in the Talmud? None. So again, you got 12 disciples walking around making a big deal. They should get some press somewhere. Nothing at all. 
So I want to close with, with one question, uh, one interesting question. So we saw clearly he ain't the Jewish Messiah. We saw clearly the historical dating is quite complicated. By the way, the last piece of why it's, it's quite complicated, the religion as we know it, or it's really evolved a lot, but the religion really as, as mankind knows it, really wasn't developed until the year three, until the third century common era, until the fourth century common era. So roughly 300 years after they even say Jesus existed is where you really had the forming of Christianity as we know it. So, so the, the question is like this. We start with the question, how do you answer someone who says, do you believe in Jesus, do you not believe in Jesus? And we say that, you know what, I don't, but why not? And, and a question that someone could ask on you is, what do you mean we got a billion followers? A billion followers can't be wrong. So one thing you can say to that is, yeah, well, there's also a billion Muslims in the world. They say you're wrong. There's a billion Confucius and Hinduists in the world. They say you're wrong. So numbers don't get you anywhere. But the question is, if it is so wrong, not, not, not wrong, but at least historically wrong, if it doesn't fit into the Jewish lexicon, doesn't fit into the Jewish spectrum at all, how did it gain such traction? How did it become such a major world religion? And, and on the flip side, how did Islam become such a major world religion? So there's a couple answers for that. Number one is for any religion to take off, you've got to have a great PR agent. Another false messiah that we saw more recently, probably the most recent uh, false messiah that made a big splash was Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi was in the 17th century in, in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire, and he would have been nothing if it wasn't for his PR agent, Nathan of Gaza. Right? Nathan of Gaza took it to the masses and, and got it out there, and he was, a, he, he was like, you know, he's the best PR agent ever. And that is what, in Christianity, Paul or Saul was. That until Saul comes along, there's nothing there. He's the one who really takes it to the masses. And he actually had a, a fight with another apostle, Another apostle by the name of Peter. Because Peter said, Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He came to improve on Judaism. Paul said, no, he came to start a religion for the masses. That's what he's here for. And they had a great fight. Who won that fight? Paul. Paul won the fight and was able to take it to the masses. What did Peter do? According to Jewish tradition, he came back to traditional Judaism. And if you ever say the Nishmas prayer on Shabbos morning, Jewish folklore says he wrote that. Okay, if he did or didn't, I don't know. Never met the guy, but that's what our tradition says. So one of the ways it got to be so popular is he had a great PR agent. You had Saul out there proselytizing to the masses. And at that point in the world, paganism was, was finished. It was bankrupt. You had, before Christianity came along, you had people running towards Judaism to convert to Judaism literally in droves. If you ever look in the Chumash, there's a commentary on the inside, uh, on the inside of each page called Unculus. Unculus was written by a, a uh, Roman convert who was the nephew of the emperor. And that's just indicative of what was going on in Rome at that time. Paganism was done. People were into monotheism. And if it wasn't for circumcision and Shabbos and brachos and kashos and all these things that came along being Jewish, it would have probably been like literally hundreds of thousands of, uh, of converts in the Roman Empire to Judaism. So what did Saul offer all these Romans who were done with paganism and really liked the idea of monotheism? It was Judaism without circumcision. It was Judaism without matzah. What could be better than that, right? It was the Jewish ideals, the Jewish ideas of monotheism, but without the obligation to do anything. It was the philosophy without the obligation. And that's how it started to take on, and that's how it started to take off. And then when Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine in the, in the 4th century, when he converts to Christianity, then the whole Roman Empire has to convert, and at that point it's unstoppable. So that's essentially how it got to be such a big force. And, and, uh, and really beyond that, is it was a, it was a proselytizing religion and, a, and a, a conquering religion, right? They conquered lands and they converted, they forcibly converted to Christianity. Us as Jews, we never did that. Muslims did the same thing. They conquered the land and converted you to Islam. That's why you got to, if, if, you, if, you, if you play like that, you get a million followers, you get a billion followers, right? That's what they do. We don't do that, so we're much smaller. So that's just a, you know, if you want to play the numbers game, that's how that plays out. Okay, we're just about the time here. I really want to thank you all for coming. By the way, I'm more than happy to hang out with any questions that you might have on the topic. You can also hit me up later on Facebook or text me or Instagram or Snapchat or however you want to get me. Once again, uh, we are off next week because it's New Year's Day, but we are meeting again on January 8th with our first pit smorg. Please take a card, share it with your friends. Please join us. Going to be some great sushi provided by Bar Sushi. Going to be some great Torah provided by uh, myself, Rabbi Friedner, Mrs. Flexer, and all our wonderful mentors for the one-on-one -on -one learning. Hope you'll join us. Hope you'll share it with your friends. And the pitch morgue will be, uh, after starting February, will be the first Tuesday of every month. Everyone have a great evening. And any questions, I'll, I'll hang around for as long as you want.